great. I asked him to leave that up because part of what I'm going to talk about has to do with that. So, um, but I'm not going to talk about that yet. So, um, I'm a little bit of context for you all. I'm a section manager at the Department of Natural Resources. And the programs that I oversee include the Invasive Species Program, which we focus on both aquatic and terrestrial, the Scientific and Natural Areas Program, and our Rare Resources Program. So I have this kind of polar opposite worlds to deal with, one where species are just booming, and the other where we're trying to fight to, to have the ones that remain to stay. So my, the context of what I'm going to talk about has to do with kind of a broad perspective from the Department of Natural Resources. Ed Quinn talked a lot about what Parks has been doing and the reasons that they are managing their lands and trying to manage for invasive species on their lands. And depending on the division that is administering the lands, the goals may be different for why they're managing their properties and what they're trying to do. And this will get a little bit at why I wanted to leave that up, um, because I think it helps us think about how we move forward with this. Just to put you in context, the Department of Natural Resources uh, administers and manages over 5 million acres of land from across the state. So um, grasslands, forest lands, wetlands, floodplain forests, all sorts of different types of properties. And we deal with a lot of different invasive species, from a number of terrestrial invasive species to aquatics. And I'm going to focus the, my conversation more on the terrestrial invasive species. So um, one of the things that has happened over the years is that we're learning. And hopefully, we continue to be a learning organization. And we do things like Ed has done and look at what's working and what's not working, record that, come back, and adjust what we're doing to do this. And I'm going to talk a little bit about how we've done that over the years. So when I first started with the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources, I was in southeastern Minnesota, where we have about every terrestrial invasive species that you can think of. And I, was, I came into the state, and buckthorn actually was not as prevalent as it is today down in southeastern Minnesota. And if you drive down there now, it is all over everywhere, especially if you drive during this time of year. You can see it everywhere. When I first came to the state, we were I remember vividly walking through up a bluff in a forested woodland with a fisheries manager, and he was pulling out buckthorn, little seedlings of buckthorn, as he went. And he could do that because it was at that scale. Now if you walk through that same forest, it is everywhere. And there's no way we could do that. And so as we've moved forward, our, our ideas have changed and we've evolved in what we're thinking. We always want to think about the idea of eradication, whether it's on a small scale or a large scale. But we also want to think about why we're concerned with invasive species. And mainly, it's because they do economic and environmental harm. So how can we get them to a point where they're not doing economic and environmental harm? That is also a success. And I think depending on your goal, that's going to look different. So if we're talking about soybeans, and it's the host of a pest for the soybeans, what level is it at where it's not doing economic harm to those soybeans? That's going to look different than if, if it's a natural system and we're trying to maintain rare plants or a native plant community, or we're trying to get timber production off that land. So depending on what our goals are, I think our desired outcomes are going to look slightly differently. And we have to think about what those goals are before we move forward. So just an example of what might be different for the Department of Natural Resources. The parks system and the scientific and natural systems are, are managing for very similar things. Scientific and natural area systems pur purchase the highest quality sites to protect them in perpetual, protect, protect them forever. <laughs> and yeah, that didn't want to come out, so I just stopped. Um, and we might purchase them because of a endangered species, or we might purchase them because of that rare natural community. Very similar to parks. They're purchasing um, high quality sites. 
And so our goals may be to maintain a rare species that actually exists in this area. And so we might be having to do very intense management to do that. So for example, we have a site down in southeastern Minnesota, a number of sites, where we are using goats. And the reason we're using goats is because they're bluff prairies with rattlesnakes on them. Very specific goal. We want rattlesnakes to stay, to stay there. And so what we're finding is that pretty much most of the native plant community is gone. The buckthorn is so intense that there's nothing in the understory. And it's so intense that it's really hard for us to get in there. Because number one, these bluff prairies are like this. So it's hard to be up there with chainsaws, believe me. And it's hard to just do that work. So our first step might be to bring the goats in. The goats can get that buckthorn down to where humans might be able to go in and better manage that site. And we do follow-up stuff. So as others were talking, it's not one step, it's multiple steps. So you might first put the goats in, then you might go in and herbicide, then you might go in and try to burn, replant, a variety of different things to get that bluff prairie back so that you can get, maintain the habitat for those rattlesnakes. And so we're doing pretty intensive management in this landscape, right? Another example is uh, Oak Savannah in southeastern Minnesota where carnivore blue butterfly are located. Very specific goal. We want to maintain the habitat for carnivore blue butterfly. It's covered with buckthorn and honeysuckle in this case. So we go into that site. We use the woodland brush mowers tear down almost everything, um, do some burning, do some herbicide where we can find the stumps, and replant. And what we're trying to do is maintain an oak savanna habitat, which is probably you know, up in this area. So we're doing some pretty intensive work, right? But it's really on a relatively small scale in these examples because it's so intense and it's fairly expensive. <coughs> and we have a very specific goal in mind. Another goal might be timber production. So in, I'll use southeastern Minnesota again because we know there's lots of buckthorn down there. Um, we have oak forests down in southeastern Minnesota. That's a, a high value timber. We want to maintain those kind of forest systems and we want to be able to get timber production off of them. Early on in the infestation of buckthorn into southeastern Minnesota, it's spreading into the natural landscape. We went in and did the harvesting the way we had before. And pretty soon we discovered that it was encouraging buckthorn to move in. So we were bringing it from maybe this scale, and I'm not tall enough to point to this side, but maybe from this scale down to that scale where it was allowing it to really take off. Our goal is to get oaks back on that site. So we started thinking what was a better way to do this. One way of adjusting for that is to say, let's pre-plant the oaks on this site, let them get high enough so that they can outgrow the buckthorn. So when we take the canopy down, we have oaks that are high and can still grow. And then eventually they're gonna shade out much of the buckthorn, probably not all of it, but we will get timber production back on that site. So as we're dealing with the invasion of these sites, and the invasive species, and the specifics to that invasive species, we're adjusting, we're evolving how we're doing that. Another thing I wanted to mention, we have looked at the Department of Natural Resources in conjunction with the University of Minnesota and other research institutes, have looked at a variety of biocontrols for various species. So purple loosestrife, we have one that's out there that's working fairly well. Again, what we have been able to do is bring that species down to a point where, where the biocontrol is being used. It's not doing the type of damage it was doing before. It's not eradicated it, but it's not doing that damage. Uh, garlic mustard, we had a very long process. The LCC and our fund in most of that process to find a biocontrol for garlic mustard. We have a hopeful biocontrol that um, we're trying to get out there for tests, but we, we found a hopeful biocontrol for garlic mustard. Now we just have to test it on the landscape. Multi-year process, 10 plus years, probably like 13 years to get to that point. Remember, these are both herbaceous plants, right? 
by uh, buckthorn, we did the same type of process as we did for garlic mustard, trying to find a biocontrol that would be effective on buckthorn, a shrub. We looked at both the seedling stage and the adult stage. We just never could find one that was super effective but also didn't impact natives to the point where it was too risky. We did this for about 10 years. We stopped doing that research. So we have looked into those kind of what are some options out there to get us to a point where we won't have to do this intensive mechanical management that we're doing. At this point for buckthorn, we haven't been able to find one of those, which is unfortunate, but um, it's also a complicated species because it has multiple stages and makes it different to look at. So one of the things as a department we try to do with invasive species is think about what our goals are and how we can get to those goals. And some of the things we also have been doing, somebody asked about, does diversity impact the invasion ability? We also try to, as we're managing our lands, try to think about what is the quality of that land right now and is our management going to actually take us from this point to that point? And then we need to be prepared to deal with the potential for species coming in to those sites. Or if it's going to take us from this point to that point, is that really our goal? And it still may be. You know, depending if it's an endangered species, if there's timber production, it still may be, but it may not be. Maybe we allow it to stay in this different state than what it initially had been. So we have a, a variety of different things that as we move forward and deal with these invasive species, we try to be a learning organization and we try to evolve in how we're managing these. But the hope is that for these species that have been here a long time, we get to a point where we can manage them on the landscape so that they're not causing the level of damage that they had been. Um, I will say that for new invasive species to the state, we really do want to know where they are, kind of the rapid response, early detection, and get out there and get rid of them at that point as quickly as we can. But at the scale Buckthorn's at, it's really about management as we move forward. So I can hand it over to Peter, or take questions if you have them. I think we have time for maybe one quick question for Ann. Dave. Ann, one thing that struck me with this uh, session, it's very interesting to have the ag presentations and then all these natural area and parks and you know you talk yep. some about forestry. It would seem like there's some real opportunities for collaboration with, say, the soybean growers vis-a-vis mm -hmm. -vis buckthorn removal in areas that are of great concern to them, you know, at, based on the outcomes of research and so on. Has the department thought about collaborations with some of these non-traditional <laughs> kind of potential allies, I guess, from my perspective? I mean, we've worked with agriculture on, on various issues over the decades with DNR. But in terms of buckthorn control, for example, right. there's been communication at that level. Yes, and I, th I think we do, um, we always are looking for collaboration and partnerships. And um, ag is an area where the Department of Natural Resources has worked together with in various aspects, um, depending on, on what aspect of the, of the ag field we're talking about and what aspect of the Department of Natural Resources. But I think any time that we can collaborate with others on meeting multiple goals is something positive. And I think this is part of why we brought these two kind of natural resource issues and agricultural issues together so we could see where those commonalities are and where we could collaborate. 